Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Miren Machia, Assistant Co-Director of the Program in Health Humanities at UVA Center for Health Humanities and Ethics. We're delighted to see many of you joining us today to learn from Dr. Suzanne Coven. Today's event is brought to you jointly by the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics and the Virginia Festival of the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Just a brief word about the structure for today's event before I introduce our speaker. All of our speakers have completed conflict of interest statements and have no disclosures to report. Please also note that continuing education credit can be claimed for today's event. We invite you to follow directions at the bottom of the handout posted in the chat to claim your continuing education. When the time comes for the question and answer portion, please send your questions through the Q&A portion on Zoom, which I will be monitoring. A brief word about our co-sponsor for today's event. It's the Virginia Festival of the Book. And please tweet about this event at hashtag VA Book Fest or hashtag VA Book 2022. The festival is free of charge, but not free of cost. Please support festival programming if you can with a donation by visiting vabook.org. That's vabook.org. Your support ensures that we may sustain the festival for many more years. After the event, we invite you to we encourage you to fill out a program evaluation. These provide useful information that helps us keep the festival free and open to the public, which you can complete online again at vabook.org slash feedback. Now I'll introduce Dr. Coven. Dr. Suzanne Coven is a primary care physician at Massachusetts General Hospital, where she also serves as the inaugural writer in residence. She was recently named the recipient of the Valerie Winchester Family Endowed Chair in Primary Care Medicine and is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Her writing has appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Boston Globe, the Lancet, the Los Angeles Review of Books and other publications and has been featured on national public radio. Her book, Letter to a Young Female Physician, Notes from, from a Medical Life, was published by W.W. Norton and Company in May 2021. In her book, Dr. Coven weaves a multitude of experiences from her life into a compelling narrative that asks, what does it mean to doctor, to teach, to tell stories, to mother, and to spend a lifetime learning? In lucid prose, she charts her course from her days as a young girl watching her father and his orthopedic practice to her own career in internal medicine and then in narrative medicine. Letter to a Young Female Physician is as much about equity for women in medicine as it is about making meaning in a complicated field and the delicate dance of balancing this work with family and self. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Coven. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathieu, for that very warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here, if only virtually. Uh, I last gave grand rounds at UVA in the fall of 2019, which I'm sure we, we can all uh, agree uh, feels like several lifetimes ago. Um, now, whenever uh, I'm uh, honored to give a named lecture, I at least uh, like to acknowledge the founder of the lecture, and in this case, uh, Dr. Ellis C. Moore. Uh, I'm informed that Dr. Moore uh, was a UVA medical graduate and an otolaryngologist in the early 20th century. Uh, I'm also told that legend has it that he removed his own wife's tonsils, which is not entirely uh, irrelevant to my book, which, uh, as uh, Dr. Mathieu mentioned, is really much about how we negotiate the balance between being people and being clinicians. Uh, removing your uh, partner's tonsils is perhaps uh, a, a bit of a <clears throat> a bit of a, too much of a balance for me, uh, but uh, apparently Dr. Moore did that. Now. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that uh, this is, uh, for me, an entirely unique experience, uh, speaking at both a Medical Grand Rounds and a literary festival uh, at the same time. Uh, it's just a wonderful confluence. It kind of sums up my own medical and literary career, and I'm very grateful to the Virginia Festival of the Book. <clears throat> Now, I'm sure many of you uh, uh, in the audience now 
uh, have thought about doing your own writing. And I'd like to start out by offering uh, the most valuable writing tip I know, which is rather than writing a about something, particularly about a big topic, uh, which I think we're often tempted to do uh, and uh, become sort of quickly uh, flummoxed, uh, I would pick a small moment that puzzles you, amuses you, um, moves you uh, unexpectedly. If you don't know why, all the better right into the question. And that's exactly what I did one day. <clears throat> it was late June 2016. I was asked to participate in a writing exercise for incoming medical interns uh, at Mass General. And the exercise was to write a letter to your future self. The letters would be gathered and then handed back to the interns six months later I um, was sitting there uh, really rather uh, somewhat uh, passively, sort of neutral about the whole experience. Uh, I had been asked to do it sort of at the last minute as a favor. And then as I looked around the conference table at the interns, most of whom were women, I noted, I found myself unexpectedly moved almost to tears. And I'd been writing long enough at this point to know that this was a um, fertile subject for writing. Uh, what did it mean, this feeling that I had? Well, I found I was moved to write a letter to myself as an intern 30 years earlier, just about to the day. Several months later, this piece was published in the New England Journal of Medicine as letter to a young female physician. Much to my surprise, uh, it was read by hundreds of thousands of people, uh, not just young people, female people or physician people, uh, got picked up by the uh, lay media and led to uh, a book by the same name, which I'll read you a little bit uh, from um, later in this talk. So what did I have to say to myself 30 years earlier? Well, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, in the 30 years uh, following, uh, that things were not going to be so great for women in medicine. Uh, it pains me to tell you that in 2017, as I'm nearing the end of my career, female physicians earn on average $20,000 less than our male counterparts. We're still underrepresented in leadership positions uh, and we're subject to sexual harassment uh, that causes some women to leave medicine altogether. But I had another message um, for my uh, 30 years ago self, uh, something a bit more personal, uh, which was that there was another obstacle I would need to contend with, one residing in my own head, which was the feeling that I was a fraud. Now, uh, this feeling that I had, uh, had a name. I didn't know it then, though it had been coined by psychologists uh, just a few years earlier. It was called imposter phenomenon, now more commonly called imposter syndrome. And originally it was described as uh, an internal experience of intellectual phoniness, uh, particularly prevalent and intense among high achieving women. Of course, we know now that it's much more prevalent than that, affects men probably as much as it affects women. Just recently, uh, it's gotten a bit of a bad name as somehow victim blaming. Uh, I don't see it that way. I think it is uh, simply descriptive. It doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, state you know, why people feel this way, but I certainly did, and I certainly had a lot of readers uh, who did. And it's this feeling that um, uh, when you're at the bedside, when you're in uh, an auditorium, perhaps when you're on a Zoom audience like now, when you're sitting around a conference table, that somehow you are the one who is not quite qualified to be there. Another way of putting this 
what is to uh, say that you have sort of an asterisk next to your name. And in fact, in medical school, my best friend and I didn't call ourselves imposters. We called ourselves the asterisks, as in we got into Johns Hopkins asterisk, but there weren't that many applicants to medical school that year. And this little asterisk can follow you around your whole life. Yes, I got that promotion, but there was nobody else. Yes, I got that job, that position, that residency, but I snowed them at the interview. Uh, and of course, along with this is uh, the fear that ultimately you will be found out uh, and uncovered for what you really are. <clears throat> now, I will tell you that uh, over the decades, uh, this feeling went away. There were a lot of uh, things that um, uh, helped it dissipate, not least of which uh, were the realization that the things that meant the most to me, um, my marriage, my uh, mothering, my uh, clinical uh, career, uh, my friendships were messy uh, processes in which it was impossible to be perfect. And yet somehow not being perfect didn't mean being fraudulent. And yet, you know, um, I think a, a little bit of this fear stayed with me because as late as 2011, when I was certainly well, well into my career, uh, I saw this op-ed in the New York Times, don't quit this day job, and I flinched. The op-ed was written by a female anesthesiologist and mother of four who argued that female physicians who elect to work part-time, as I had <clears throat> since um, my second child was born years earlier, uh, were letting down their patients, letting down their colleagues, and letting down the funders of their uh, medical education, including the federal government. The accompanying illustration was salt in the wound. It features a veritable physician Barbie vacuuming um, a, a rug uh, in a stethoscope and white coat as the children play in the background. Uh, well, this uh, infuriated me. I wrote a counter editorial uh, in the Boston Globe, arguing that if you think about it, all doctors are part-time doctors, all patients are potentially full-time patients, and that in fact, the largest growing segment of the physician population that is electing to work part-time uh, is older men. One thing we can say is that uh, the cure for imposter syndrome is not achievement. Uh, these are among the people who have spoken openly about their own feelings of imposter syndrome. Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, Lady Gaga, Sonia Sotomayor, Serena Williams. As I like to, to think, uh, if Serena Williams is a fraud, then there isn't much hope for the rest of us. Clearly, she is not. Clearly, none of them are. And you know what, neither are we. But the brass rings, the prizes, the promotions, the matching at just the right program, um, these don't alleviate uh, the feeling of impostorship. And in fact, really only uh, throws gas on the fire because the more brass rings we accumulate, the more unworthy we feel. The transformation has to be internal and not through external validation. Now, I have a confession to make, which is that when I wrote this piece in the New England Journal, I um, uh, wrote about two what I thought were different things. One, the persistence of a gender gap and sexism uh, in medicine, and the other, imposter syndrome. And I didn't think of them as being linked. After I wrote the piece and thought about it more, and particularly when uh, I got just tons of feedback, letters uh, from um, physicians and non-physicians, I came to realize that these two were very much related, um, particularly for women of color in medicine, 
uh, many of whom wrote me and said, well, yeah, of course I feel like an imposter. I get told I am in small and large ways uh, all day, every day. Why wouldn't I feel that way? So one way to think about imposter syndrome is internalized bias. And that got me really curious about this question. What is the status of women in medicine today? Um, how far have we come since uh, July 1st, 1986, uh, when I first put on my white uniform pants uh, and uh, started my internship? Well, the answer to that um, is not nearly far enough, and in fact, not very far at all. Um, when it comes to women in medicine today, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that there are more of us, particularly at the training and entry level. The bad news is just about everything else. And in the next few slides, I'm just going to um, sort of uh, show uh, in graphic form uh, some of the disparities uh, with which many of you may be familiar, uh, but many of you may be shocked by, and I have to tell you some of these shocked me. So when we look at medical school applications, um, uh, green being men, uh, purple being women, uh, when I applied to medical school back in 1980, 81 or so, uh, uh, men greatly outnumbered women, um, uh, those lines have crossed. Now women slightly outnumber men. And uh, as of 2019, uh, across the board, women are the majority of medical students. My son just started medical school this past fall. His class is 60% female, and that's not uncommon. If we look at training programs, uh, there are certain specialties in which the vast majority of residents are women, OBGYN 83%, uh, pediatrics 71%, uh, and, and so forth. And then we have fields which are traditionally uh, male dominated, orthopedics, urology, interventional cardiology, ENT, which uh, no coincidence are the highest paying fields uh, which are really lagging uh, behind. Why is that? It's sort of a chicken and an egg. A specialty is perceived as being less welcoming to women. Fewer women apply. Fewer women, therefore, are in it. It is less welcoming to women. Fewer women apply, and so forth. That is changing, but changing slowly. Now, if we look at the faculty level, um, men still uh, outnumber women, though we're, we're gaining a bit overall. But here's really sort of where the rubber meets the road. We are stuck at the instructor um, and assistant professor level and have made very few gains in the associate and the professor level. If we look at division chiefs and department heads, we've made very little progress. And I should mention, this is all data from the AAMC uh, 2018 report on uh, women in medicine. And then if we look at med school deans, uh, it's really striking. Uh, from 2009 to 2018, the number of female deans increased by about one a year on average not 1%, the number one. And then finally, um, in terms of editors of leading medical journals, uh, representation of women is, um, is well, here's the spoiler, it, it's not very good. Um, there aren't many women uh, uh, who are editors in chief of major medical journals. So all of this undoubtedly led uh, uh, this young female physician to tweet a few months ago, in 1993, 42% of entering med students were women. I was eight years old. We've said this a thousand times, but I still wonder where all the years went 
and where those women are now and why aren't they my bosses? Well, why indeed? I think a little bit of the answer comes here. If we look in academic medicine, uh, 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 gender disparity, we see that women um, have lower salaries still, uh, less uh, access to funding, to mentors, recognition, uh, like being asked to be a grand round speaker, present company uh, accepted. And I think um, this is uh, the bottom line here uh, is a big part of it. They're more likely to be spending um, more hours in domestic and parenting activities. This was a, a seminal a study from Annals <clears throat> in 2014 showing that mothers versus fathers in academic medicine spend over a day uh, of work per week uh, on childcare. And those hours have to come from somewhere. They're less likely to spend time on research, uh, more likely uh, to take time off um, if there's a disruption in childcare. And if you think anecdotally or perhaps about your own experience uh, uh, of income, of promotion, uh, of research funding, et cetera, um, family obligation, uh, also taking care of elderly parents, by the way, uh, may be a large part of it. Now, I should say that, um, you know, there are many women who choose to ramp down their careers, choose to spend more time uh, with family and at home, uh, as I did, uh, and certainly feel very privileged and fortunate to do so, as I did. Uh, but I think the point of these numbers is that uh, for many women, it's not really a choice. And it is a disparity that has become so deeply entrenched in medical culture that we barely think to question it. Um, another thing that we have to mention in terms of the gender gap in medicine is just harassment. Uh, and these numbers are appalling. One in three women in medicine have been harassed. Uh, uh, members of underrepresented minorities are more likely to be harassed. Uh, only half of women feel safe reporting this. Uh, and um, people who experience harassment may just uh, leave rather than staying and reporting it. And you know, if you think about the hashtag right now uh, in support of women in medicine, give her a reason to stay, that's a pretty sad rallying cry. And harassment can be uh, unwelcome physical contact, um, put downs, condescending comments, sexist jokes, um, and vulgar uh, references. This was a, a study uh, out of the M MGH uh, surgery department just a few months ago, uh, show showing that 100% of female surgical residents had reported gender-based discrimination by patients. Now, you know, we could say, look, we're all professionals and when patients are sick and frightened, maybe they say dumb stuff. Uh, that is true. Uh, and we certainly have broad shoulders. Um, but I think what really hurts is the lack of support by colleagues when sexist or racist comments are made by the bedside. Uh, and you know, I think if you were a colleague who witnesses this to say that was inappropriate, we've got your back goes a long way and it doesn't happen nearly often enough. Given all I've said, it's not shocking to learn that women are more likely to experience burnout, that women in medicine have higher rates of dying by suicide uh, than our male counterparts uh, as um, represented so sadly uh, by Dr. Lorna Breen, who uh, died by suicide early in the pandemic in New York. Um, and headlines in the New York Times a few months ago highlighted that female physicians are more likely to have pregnancy loss, 
uh, and more likely to experience infertility, largely because of pressure to defer childbearing and to work in appropriate hours during pregnancy, about which I'll say a little bit personally in a moment. And COVID has made all this worse, including the gender pay gap, largely because of um, the childcare crisis that COVID uh, has precipitated. So uh, I'd like to turn from all of that um, grim news to uh, a couple of intriguing studies that I think uh, raise some interesting questions about women in medicine. Uh, the first uh, was from 2017, a large uh, study of uh, patients uh, insured by Medicare admitted to the hospital, turned out that um, patients of female physicians were less likely to die or be readmitted within 30 days after hospitalization, of course, prompting uh, the press to ask whether women were better doctors. And then this is really, I have to say, uh, my favorite, uh, and uh, uh, I just find this so fascinating. Uh, this was uh, from Brigham, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, lead author was uh, my young colleague, Ashani Ganjali, uh, showing that women uh, physicians in primary care spend on average 2.4 minutes extra compared with male physicians uh, during outpatient visits. Now you could say, well, 2.4 minutes, that's really nothing, isn't it? Uh, well, if we average that out over a day, week, uh, month, year, it turns out if you're being paid on productivity to be um, about a 15% loss of income, which is roughly what the gender uh, pay gap is. So what are we talking with our patients about during those extra 2.4 minutes? Um, I've talked with Ashani about this. Uh, it seems that we spend more time explaining tests, ordering tests, um, and just simply talking. Um, I uh, thought about this a few years ago when I wrote a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine called Doctor's New Dilemma. And the dilemma that I perceived went like this. You walk into an exam room, a patient's been waiting for you, they're reading a book. It's a book you've read. Um, you see the cover of it. You have a choice. Do you say, hey, I read that book, what do you think of it? And you, you know, further nourish your bond with that patient, but you spend precious minutes and you're falling behind. Or do you pretend you didn't see the cover of the book, lose the opportunity to further that bond, but stay more on time? I uh, don't want to suggest that uh, women are better doctors than men, or, or that women are more empathic uh, people uh, than men. But I do think this is that women, when we reach this, court, this fork in the road, are acculturated to be more likely to ask, how did you like that novel? And men, I think when they reach that fork in the road are more acculturated to not ask and to stay on time. <clears throat> I'm happy to, uh, during the Q&A, entertain your thoughts about that. But I think uh, the fact that it's a dilemma at all uh, is bad for both men uh, and for women. And, not least of which for patients. So here's our dilemma. We engage, we fall behind, we get burned out, we don't engage. We have the existential crisis of uh, asking ourselves, well, if I'm not engaging, what am I here for? And that produces moral injury and a different kind of burnout. So clearly we need to change policies. And you know, you've heard about the he for she movement and um, and uh, men have asked, how can we help with the gender gap? <clears throat> and here's my suggestion. Look in your own backyard. What is going on with recruitment, retention, promotion of female um, physicians, uh, and not to mention uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, and so forth? Um, what's going on with equity and research funding, mentorship, 
family leave and childcare, which is not uh, a female uh, issue exclusively? How about physician mental health? And how about harassment, which yes, takes place in nice institutions like yours and nice institutions like mine, places full of wonderful people who think that we are enlightened about all of this, and yet it still happens and our processes are very imperfect and uh, it causes uh, many women to leave, as I said. But it's not only about policy, it's also about culture. It's about the story. Uh, and the story we have accepted in medicine is that um, it's tough and we need to be self-sacrificing. And, um, you know, uh, if you have uh, particular needs, uh, like the need for equal pay and, and the need uh, not to be punished for having children, uh, that, that somehow you'll, you'll be left behind the wounded deer. Uh, this is deeply entrenched in medical culture. Um, but I think that there are ways we can begin to change it. One of my favorite ways is through medical humanities. I imagine I would, uh, I would get some agreement in this audience. Uh, this is uh, the monthly uh, literature medicine group that I've had the pleasure to lead at Mass General now for about 14 years. Uh, we, uh, we meet after work lately, of course, on Zoom, and we read Shakespeare and we read Chekhov and, um, and uh, we read Toni Morrison. We're working our way through all of her novels. And, and uh, this enormously enriches uh, our lives as healthcare workers, and I think is also ultimately helpful to our patients. Um, how validating is it to know that William Carlos Williams over 100 years ago, uh, when he was practicing medicine and pediatrics in his home in Rutherford, New Jersey, uh, was suffering from his own imposter syndrome, uh, worrying about his journals accumulating uh, and, uh, and piling up and how he needed to get them in the right order uh, and read them 10 years back. Um, and by the way, get a new suit and a new uh, haircut so that think people would think he was a really great doctor. Um, I think that reaching uh, back in, in space and time uh, through literature uh, is just enormously uh, validating and comforting because imposter syndrome, like all forms of shame, uh, thrives on isolation. We study history and, and know that Elizabeth Blackwell, uh, the first female graduate of an American medical school, and Rebecca Lee Crumpler, the first black female graduate of, a, of an American medical school, uh, struggled with sexism, with racism in Crumpler's case as well. Uh, and we realized that many of the issues uh, that they dealt with, that they wrote about, that they discussed, are ones we're still talking about today not least of which is the thorny question of women of whether women in medicine are better off or worse off claiming to bring some special qualities to medicine um, this was uh believe it or not um uh, a great um uh, topic of discussion 150 years ago and we can learn uh from our patients particularly patients uh, who have written so eloquently, including, including the um, uh, poet and uh, activist and uh, breast cancer, uh, cancer patient, Audre Lorde, uh, who decided to turn her cancer into a literary and political act. I do not wish my anger and pain and fear about cancer to fossilize into yet another silence. Um, she wrote, social media, uh, which is all kinds of awful, as we know, uh, can actually be extraordinarily helpful in changing the story. Here are two quick examples. Uh, some of you may remember uh, that this New Yorker cover with four female surgeons a few years ago uh, inspired the Looks Like a Surgeon uh, campaign on Twitter, in which female surgeons all over the world reenacted um, the illustration. And then you may have heard of the uh, hashtag med bikini 
uh, campaign, which was started by Carmen Simmons, a fourth year medical student, after the Journal of Vascular Surgery um, uh, published a, an online article. The, the print version was redacted ultimately, um, questioning whether it was, uh, quote, professional uh, for um, uh, female physicians to post pictures of themselves in swimwear on their personal social media accounts. I think this raises all kinds of questions about whether professionalism is sometimes a code word for sexism uh, and racism and whether it's not okay or okay to look a certain way uh, in order uh, to be in medicine. Uh, my personal favorite uh, posting, and there were thousands of them, including by men in swimwear, I have to say, uh, was from this emergency room doctor in Hawaii uh, who uh, was wearing her red bikini uh, when she came upon the victim of a boating accident uh, and saved his life. So Elizabeth Blackwell, uh, whose bicentenary we celebrated last year, uh, said that if society will not admit of women's free development, then society must be remodeled. I think that in medicine, some of this remodeling is going to take place around conference tables like this one, around uh, Zoom rooms like this one, uh, with conversation. These are conversations um, that we haven't had nearly to the extent uh, that perhaps we think we, we have had. I certainly realized that in the wake of publishing uh, my book. And, um, you know, there were a lot of things that I thought I'd thought about, I thought I'd thought through, I thought I'd spoken with my colleagues about that in the wave of conversations that ensued on my virtual book tour realized actually hadn't happened at all. What I'd like to do now um, is just read you a brief section uh, and then Dr. Michu and I will, um, will have a, a conversation which we'll invite you to join. So a great uh, pleasure of uh, personal writing is you get to revisit your own life and um, ask questions like, I thought what, I did what? All these little pat episodes that you know you think or uh, you understand completely and then you realize that you don't understand them at all. Uh, one of those for me was the fact that um, I got pregnant at the end of my internship year when I was working 110 hours a week. Um, I didn't realize, I was, realized that I was uh, pregnant at first. Uh, I was gaining weight, I was exhausted, and I was amenorrheic, so naturally I thought this was because I was an intern. Uh, anyway, uh, I finally figured out I was uh, pregnant, but I asked for no accommodation in my work hours, um, and this is what happened next. Once I learned I was pregnant, I started taking prenatal vitamins, faithfully complied with all the recommended obstetrical visits, blood tests, and ultrasounds. Still, I drifted through my last two trimesters in a kind of oblivion, not requesting any change in my work hours. I first felt my baby move early one morning as I stole a few minutes of rest on an empty patient bed in the coronary care unit where I was on call as a junior resident. Strange as it sounds, being pregnant as a resident made me feel more macho. The pride I felt in telling and retelling the story of first feeling my baby move while on call in the CCU was a macho pride. My swagger had a price though. I spent the last six weeks of my pregnancy confined at home with preeclampsia, my dangerously high blood pressure no doubt caused by my long work hours. After months of wanting nothing more than sleep, I was now forbidden to leave my bed. I now ask myself why I was so unquestioning of a system that was fundamentally hostile to women and certainly to mothers. Perhaps I was oblivious to the sexism that existed during my residency in the 1980s and persists in medicine today because it was ubiquitous as air. 
I failed to perceive, much less question, the sexism that was no less a part of my medical training than donuts before morning rounds, pizza at new time lectures, and coffee all night long. Not long ago, I spoke with Edward, my friend from residency. We hadn't been in touch for a few years and feeling the urge to reach out that so many of us have felt during the COVID-19 pandemic, we arranged a Sunday morning coffee date on Zoom. During our conversation, we compared his experience of racism during our residency with my experience of sexism. I told him the more I thought back to those days, the more mystified and ashamed I felt about my complicity in a system that had so little regard for me. That's where you're wrong, said Edward. They loved you. Me too. We were stars. We made them look good and they heaped praise on us. But at some level, we knew how easily we might be discarded if we made a wrong step. And that's why we worked so hard to be perfect. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Coven, for that wonderful talk and for sharing that, that segment of your book with us. I would encourage folks to start asking questions in the Q&A, which I'll intersperse in our conversation. But the first question I had for you was really a process question. I'm curious about what it was like writing this book, um, what you sort of had in mind when you started out writing it, and if there was anything surprising along the way, or if it turned out kind of what you had in mind when you began. <laughs> well, what I would say is that um, is that writing your first book is sort of like being an intern or having your first child, which is that if you really know what it involved, you probably wouldn't do it, and you're you're sort of spared by never having done it uh, before. Um, uh, everything about it was surprising to me, um, and what I didn't realize, of course, is that that was a good sign. Uh, I do a lot of you know, writing, coaching, and mentorship. And what I always tell people is if you know what you have to say, you probably shouldn't say it, that the writing is the discovery. I thought when I started writing this book that I was writing a very different book. I thought I was writing a memoir, uh, not a series of essays. Uh, it evolved uh, and um, uh, it was both much harder and much joyful than I would have anticipated. Joyful in the discovery of taking moments like that. You know, we all have them. We all have our little tapes that we play. Oh, you know, I got pregnant when I was an intern, blah, blah, blah. Well, and then, you know, 30, 35 years later to say, wait a minute, I really didn't ask for any accommodation when I was working 110 hours. Why would that have been? And then the icing on the cake, which I really wouldn't have anticipated, is then to zoom around the country and talk to young women now about how they feel about um, embarking on uh, pregnancies or adoption, um, uh, you know, during uh, training, or even women actually um, in male-dominated careers that aren't med uh, medicine. And finding out that actually not a whole lot has changed since then. You know, this desire to be a team player, to not be a complainer, those are still very, very much entrenched in our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting um, because as I was reading your book, I was reflecting on my experiences. You know, I've only been an attending for a few years, but just thinking about my training and the few years that I've been um, an assistant professor here at UVA and the things that uh, I, I look back on and I am surprised that I didn't maybe notice something happening at the time it was happening. Um, like comments some of my male colleagues made in medical school that at the time I sort of dismissed as, oh, you know, they're immature. I, you know, I'm not gonna pay attention to it. And now looking back, I think that was something that could have been reportable. And I, it just didn't occur to me because I don't know why, I, I guess, I was sort of socialized to think this is this is how guys are, and I'm just going to ignore it because I don't really I don't really care what they have to say. But um, it it is kind of surprising to think about the ways that we are inadvertently complicit in these systems. Mm -hmm. And you sort of touched on this when you mentioned the he for she campaign, but I was wondering if you had any specific examples from your experience or things you've heard in going around the country 
of colleagues who have been able to successfully change policies. Because I think one of the things that's so tough is that there are, there are so many layers to the incentives in academic medicine. And so you may have a, a, a leader who wants to support women in theory, but they have a dean or a CEO of a medical center who has certain bottom line that needs to be that needs to be achieved. So how, have you seen examples of that working successfully? Yes, and I think you've hit right on right on the key point here, which is that we can't make this is not a this is not a, a bottom up um, process, um, except in the in the sort of an indirect sense. Uh, we can't have meaningful change until women are in the highest positions of power and influence. We can have wonderful female mentors, that's great, um, but. Um, we know that if the department chair is a woman, uh, if the division chief is a woman, if the dean is a woman, that uh, issues around um, uh, around uh, uh, gender disparity are more likely to be taken seriously and um, and acted upon. Um, I think the other thing is is just not to make assumptions. I think there are a lot of men. Um, and women too. I mean, I, I think I have done this myself, who thought, you know, we're, we're good people, we're doctors, we take care of people. Um, and, you know, we're in this wonderful, you know, uh, bastion of learning. Uh, well, then if you get into a position like I've been in the last few years where I do a lot of mentorship, you hear the stories of people who don't have a whole lot of voice and power and you hear what happens to them when they're harassed. You hear what happens to them when they question the promotion process. It's not pretty. Um, it's not across the board that it happens this way, um, but things may not, you know, what I would say is if you want to know what's happening, ask down, don't ask up. Uh, somebody in the, in the chat has asked whether my reading groups include men. Uh, they most certainly uh, do uh, include uh, men, non-clinicians, uh, basically all healthcare workers. Interestingly though, and I think this is true of book groups in general, um, the women tend to outnumber the men about 10 to 1 by self-selection. Thank you. And I do want to make sure we get to some of these other questions in the chat. I, I see one question. Um, somebody's asking, what advice would you have for a future doc who wants to avoid being socialized into the mindset that, as you cited, ignores the, the book the patient is reading when you walk into the room? What a great question. Um, well, I think the fact that you're even asking that question, um, you know, shows that you're more than halfway there. Uh, I think that um, there are two parts of it. One is to um, is to recognize that your desire to ask what novel are you reading is valuable uh, and incredibly valuable to the patient. And if you ask patients, they will tell you that. Uh, but then the second step is realizing that you are being punished for that, uh, and to you know make a little noise about being uh, punished for that. Ultimately. Uh, in in um, my practice, uh, we converted from a pay for productivity to sort of pay for patient panel model, uh, and it, I think it's it's really uh, greatly enhanced our um, ability to to say things like you know how'd you like that novel? It's not perfect. We're still more rushed than I think we should be, uh, but this feeling that you have to get through so many widgets per day. Is, is actually much improved. And that was a top-down uh, decision. Thank you. I do see someone else asking, what recommendations do you have for residency programs to improve hours for pregnant residents and residents who are new parents? You know, this is so tough because, oh, uh, again, not, not to blame um, the victim any more than I blame myself, but the way the system uh, stays calcified is that nobody wants to be the one to ask for accommodation. Well, the reason I'm making air quotes is that uh, I think, you know, not working um, ridiculous hours when you're pregnant and then getting a life-threatening condition 
um, I think seeking to avoid getting a life threatening condition for you and, and for your uh, baby is not unreasonable. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's helpful. Um, it's helpful to uh, band together. It's helpful to um, and it's helpful to make people uh, higher up in the chain of command aware of what's actually happening. When I went around the country and I had um, you know women, uh, young women tell me, uh, yeah, actually what you went through, it's not that different today. You know, we're afraid to uh, ask for favors uh, from our colleagues when we're pregnant or when we have infants at home. Um, I guarantee you that there were uh, people in positions of leadership in those programs who were unaware of the kind of self censor censorship uh, that women uh, were imposing upon themselves by necessity. It's like my friend Edward said to me about his experience of racism. You know, yes, we feel accepted, but we feel like if we step out of line just a little, everything is going to go bad. And so we have to be perfect. And being perfect means not causing anybody trouble and getting pregnant and needing a maternity leave and needing accommodations of work hours is somehow causing trouble. That, that I feel is a culture that we can change. And boy, if we can't change it, when we have medical schools where you know, 55, 60% of the class are women, if we can't change that in the coming years, uh, then I think we're, we're in more trouble than I thought. Right, and switching gears a little bit to back to the, the question of, of women uh, putting in more work or different types of work than men in these studies. Somebody asked if there's been any research done on my chart or EMR messages to male versus female physicians. And during COVID, this person says they felt like their messages have been much more involved than some of their male colleagues' messages. Hmm. You know, I, I'm not aware of that, but it it uh, it certainly um, it certainly wouldn't surprise me uh, if that study hasn't been done. I think the person who asked the question should absolutely do it. The the study I want someone to do uh, is one that I did anecdotal anecdotally and um, completely unintentionally, uh, which is um, I had a severe trauma of my right arm. Uh, and my accommodation when I came back was doing everything for three weeks during doing everything uh, uh, in twice as much time as I had been doing it previously. I don't think I've ever been a better doctor than I was in those three weeks. Mm. And here's the study I want done. I think I ordered fewer tests and wrote fewer prescriptions because I spent more time talking. And I think we use tests and prescriptions as exit passes to get out of the room. I know I certainly have. Right. That's such a great point. And, you know, in reflecting in my own practice, I feel like the days that I have fewer patients on my schedule are more enjoyable, not simply because I'm doing less work, they're more enjoyable because even if I spend the exact same amount of time at clinic, I'm having those conversations about the book the person's reading, or in my case in pediatrics, you know, maybe what, what the child wants to do when they grow up or how school is going, how school, how school really going and tell me about that friend, tell me about your dog. And it, it feels it feels so empty when you don't have the time to have those conversations. And maybe you you did what you needed to do in that you vaccinate, you got all the vaccines in and you refill the prescriptions and you you did a full physical exam, but you don't feel as fulfilled. And I suspect the patient doesn't feel as fulfilled. Yes, and this actually dovetails uh, with a question that's still in the chat, which is um, it, it has um, measurable effects on the patients. We know that in primary care, if patients uh, feel that uh, they have a good rapport with their physician, that you know their um, diabetes control is improved, their blood pressure control is improved. I mean, trust is a huge um, therapeutic tool. And how do you establish trust with someone? Well, it's how we establish trust with, with anybody. Uh, we communicate, we listen to their story. Um, we allow them to say their piece, uh, and um, 
you know, I think too often what we're being measured on, how many mammograms, how many vaccines and so forth, uh, is not really what's most important to the patient. But it shouldn't be an either or. I mean, the message that I want to um, convey here is that we don't have to choose, uh, as I say in my book, uh, uh, paraphrasing uh, one of my physician writer colleagues, we don't have to choose between science and kindness in medicine. Uh, I actually think we not only can have both, we have to have both. I used to routinely refer um, patients to, to uh, specialists where I would say, well, you know, he's, you know, he's not going to be your best friend, but, you know, he's technically he's great. I don't refer people to, the, uh, to those people anymore. I don't think you can be a, a, a great physician if you're only a great technician. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I don't know the exact data on surgical complication when there's been a poor relationship with the patient, but I, I can guess what it is. Right. And you mentioned um, with respect to medical training and, and sort of just in general, the importance of integrating the health humanities into what we do and, and the relevance of that, what you're saying. But I'm also curious if there are other changes you think we should make to the way that we structure our residency programs, the way that we teach our trainees. Because in thinking back to my residency, which was not that long ago, I do think you sort of learn that productivity as in how much can you get done in the EMR as success and get the thing that gets you through the day and gets you moved up to the next, to the next level the next year, how do we change our residency programs to reward people who do take that extra time and, and reward people who are kind physicians? Well, I think um, there are a lot of things that tell us that we have a big structural problem, not least of which is the last couple of days on Twitter, you know, all of these wonderful, um, you know, uh, fourth year medical students uh, who are you know wanting to do family medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, fields in which we have tremendous shortages uh, who aren't matching because there aren't spaces. So, uh, and, and what does that mean? It means that the people who do have the spaces are, are working that much more because there isn't less work, there are just fewer spaces. So one, I think just more spaces in training uh, programs. I'm not one of these you know good old days kind of people who you know wants young people to work like I did. Um, I, I don't think there was actually much good about the pre-duty hour days. So one, I think just more people, but also uh, uh, just more, uh, more recognition uh, that this sort of cowboy, um, self-sacrificing, you know, win at any cost uh, ethos uh, really needs to go. And um, there are, you know, certain things about it, you know, that are probably good. I mean, I I, I like to think that, um, you know, I, I stick by my patients through thick and thin, and even when I'm tired, that you know, and I'm inconvenienced, that you know, I'm still there for them. But enough is enough. Uh, you know, we have a, a suicide rate uh, among medical students uh, and uh, trainees that is appalling. Uh, and uh, so much of that is overwork, isolation, unrealistic expectations, lack of mentorship, um, not to mention racism and sexism. Thank you. I think that mentorship piece is huge and something that I think about a lot now as an attending, you know, what kind of example am I setting for my, my trainees and my medical students? Um, I do recognize that we're up against time, and so I want to respect people's time. And so I would love to thank you um, very deeply, Dr. Coben, for joining us today. This has been a really wonderful conversation, and I'm so glad that, that we could have you here virtually for this talk. I want to thank everyone for attending and participating in today's Medical Center Hour, and especially to Virginia Festival of the Book for co-sponsoring today's event. Just a quick reminder again to please fill out the survey on vabook.org slash feedback. And please, of course, don't forget to buy a copy of Letter to a Young Female Physician from the New Dominion Bookshop if you're here in Charlottesville or from your local bookstore. Stay, stay, stay safe, everyone, and thank you again, Dr. Coven. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thanks.